We're in our sixth week of our study of the minor prophets, and we've called it Major on the Minors. So this is week six. We're at the halfway mark. I mentioned that I'm going to be gone for a couple Sundays, and I'm enjoying this series so much that I'm not going to share. So the guys that are going to speak, they're going to be speaking on different topics. I'm saving the rest of these for myself. Um, Here's part of why. Because this is, I'm growing so much in my own biblical literacy. That's kind of one of the goals of this series is to increase our biblical literacy, to increase our biblical knowledge, to not only read more of the word, but to also like gain knowledge of what is this about. And then to learn that those, those timeless biblical principles that we find in these books that are written in the 8th century, 6th century B.C., that they still have relevance for us today as people individually and as the church. So we've said over and over, and I just want to keep saying it, that these are called the minor prophets because of the length. That's it. It's not about the message or the importance or less important or anything like that. That this is about just a simple classification based on size. What we've been finding out and what we're going to find out again today is that these minor prophets get right to the point and that their message is very strong and very relevant for us today. So today we're going to be in the book of Micah, if you want to find your way there. As you're doing that, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your word. God, thank you that today that we start to see over and over, but today it just becomes so clear that that your word uh, was going out at this time and that it was relevant then and it's relevant now. And that we see the different people that you use to bring your word, but the cohesiveness and the continuity of the message. And so, God, today as we go through this uh, high-level view of of Micah, would you just use this time in your word to speak to us, Lord, to help us to gather these principles and to help them to guide and apply to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, again, I like to start with some kind of historical context and background of the book. So Micah was a a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. So they were both ministering in the same kind of area and same time. So uh, Isaiah, we have a picture of the divided kingdom. This was all happening during the divided kingdom. Isaiah and Micah both coming from Judah and some of their prophecy going into Israel, uh, but coming from the kingdom of Judah. Micah, also from the southern kingdom, Micah was ministering during that same time where we looked at Amos and Hosea. So Amos and Hosea ministering in the northern kingdom and Micah ministering in the southern kingdom. And Micah gives us a a good clue, like many of these minor prophets, as to when this all occurred. Micah 1.1 says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So I have one more picture. Just again, this just helps me. Uh, it's not the greatest detail, I understand that, but about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem is Moresheth, or not, it was Moresheth. So it gives you some context of where Micah came from and kind of uh, his, the length of his ministry. It's a wide range of dates covering those kings. So he ministered probably a 50 to 60 year ministry. Uh, This book is not like one message. It's kind of a compilation of his messages over those years. And likely hard to nail down an exact date of writing, but sometime between 735 and 700 B.C. would help us get. What is the difference between accuracy and precision, right? We would, be, we would be on the target, let's just say it that way. We would be on the target if we use those dates. We may not hit a bullseye, but we'll be on the target. So I already mentioned he's a contemporary of Isaiah, but there's a neat uh, connection to the book of Jeremiah as well uh, from the prophet Micah. Uh, if you, in your own time, make a note, read Jeremiah chapter 26. So here's the Reader's Digest version. Jeremiah gets a word uh, from the Lord, goes to Judah to give the people a word uh, to call them to repentance, okay? So as you can imagine and as we've begun to see, a lot of times that message is not received very well, right? So he goes to Judah and he says, hey guys, guess what? Uh, Repent. And they say, no, I think actually we're just going to kill you. 
And Jeremiah goes, okay, go ahead. Just so you know, I was bringing a word from the Lord to you, so you do whatever you got to do. And then one of the elders kind of steps up and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There was a guy named Micah that came here and said very similar things that Jeremiah is saying, and Hezekiah didn't kill him. In fact, Hezekiah repented, and, and we should probably do that too, right? Instead of killing the prophet. So there's that neat tie or connection. And the reason that I want to share that aspect of it is because these guys that we're looking at here, they're not ministering in a vacuum. Does that make sense? These aren't... We, we see so much crossing over of message and region... And it wasn't that God had this message that he wanted to get out and the internet speed was terribly slow and so he just had to wait until you did the dial-up thing, right? Like, he wasn't like getting getting his message out. It, It wasn't that. He chose these different people to bring his message to all these areas and the message isn't different. That's the main thing that we're hearing and we're learning is this continuity between the message that God is sending out. So because the internet speed was so bad, God just chose to use lots of people to send his, inter- his message out, right? So the idea being is that, especially these minor prophets, we can tend to grab one of them, maybe it comes up in our daily reading schedule or whatever, and we read it and we go, I have no idea what that meant. I don't know what that's about, but it sounded like something bad happened, and then maybe something good might happen. But the people and the the topics and the references are a part of Scripture. And when we start to see all this crossover between these prophets as they minister through the different times and different regions, we start to see this continuity that comes that helps us to understand and to strengthen our faith that God wrote this book. That God wrote this book. That he used human authors, but the Holy Spirit inspired those authors to write that book. And that it's not about one message from one ministry to one region, but that it's a, it's a complete message of God's redemptive plan for all of mankind and that God wrote it. So that's just, a, I just give you that background because I'm going to reference it in a little while too. But it's important for us to see that these are not happening in isolated incidents, that these guys are crossing over in ministry and region and a message is given to them by God for the people. And the message remains the same. And it's the same message we get today. So there's a couple of principles that Micah shows us as we look at this. The first one is divine judgment. That there is divine judgment. And when I say divine judgment, I'm not talking about the same kind of divine judgment uh, that we talked about when we looked at Saul's call to devote the Amalekites to destruction. Okay, to kill man, woman, child, horse and donkey, everything. Um, We did a video sermon on that topic last summer. It's on our uh, YouTube channel, so I'd just reference you to that if you want to learn more about the idea of divine judgment in that sense as being a sacrifice to God. This is more like the divine judgment in the sense that God is saying that this is sin, and because God defines what sin is, God also defines the judgment for sin. That's the idea, that it's a divine judgment. So Micah comes out and he begins this word by calling out the cities of Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, and Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom. That's how he begins. Uh, Micah 1.5, All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So Micah is talking about the divine judgment that is coming to these cities, okay? And he makes it very clear that the judgment is coming from the Lord. That's the idea. Micah 1.3 For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. One of the ways to kind of explain this, and I've only lived in Oregon for a couple years, so I feel like I can still say this. The reason that he talks about the high places and he talks about Samaria and Jerusalem 
is because the things that were happening in those places would represent that area. Those are the main hubs. Those are the main cities, okay? So if you take someone from a place like Minnesota, very unfamiliar with Oregon and the West Coast altogether, when I hear Oregon, I think Portland. I think Salem, okay? That's the idea. Those are the ideas. That these are the places that Micah is calling out to as a representation of what is happening in those areas, okay? So what is he seeing and what is he going to point out? Letter A under that divine judgment is abuse of power. Micah sees abuse of power. Micah 2.1, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. Again, God delivering this message through many prophets. This idea of abuse of power. Just like Amos and Micah, just like Amos, Micah has a focus from the Lord on the abuse of power by the wealthy over the poor. The abuse of the wealthy over the poor. And the idea here is that this sin, this abuse of power, is a premeditated sin. You make a plan to sin, to take advantage of the situation and the circumstances that you have because of the power that you have. Because, let's be honest, that's the only time you can really make a plan and then do it, is if you have the power to actually make that happen. Does that make sense? You can't make a plan and do the plan if you don't have the power to make that happen. So it's a, an abuse of the power that these people have. Now, we see this in the case of like a sexual offense, a sexual assault. Those types of things uh, carry stiffer penalties if a person was in a place of power over the, uh, uh, the victim. Okay, There's a power dynamic that's set up that's, that's to be protected and this abuse of power is something that, that he points out. We see this in the same way. Uh, a violation when power is wielded in a way that creates a bigger separation between those with power and those without. So a way that one would wield their power in order to create a bigger divide between the ones with the power and the ones without the power. So Micah points out the abuse of power and then he shows the judgment for the abuse of power in 2.4. In that day, they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate, he allots our fields. The idea is these people were taking things from the poor because they had the ability to do so. They had the power to say, nice field my field now. And what, what Micah is saying, the judgment for that is, you thought those were your fields, actually they're mine, and I'm going to give them to some people from a totally different kingdom, and they're going to send you into exile. So, nice field, my field. Right? The people who are receiving this judgment would be saying, wait a minute, we're God's chosen people. How can you take this away from me? But it's a judgment for the abuse of power. And it's a great question for us. Can we thumb our nose up at God and expect him to just sit there and allow sin to prevail forever? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. This principle of sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. These people were sowing the abuse of power. And for that, they're reaping that judgment for that sin. And so we wonder, what are we sowing? What are we sowing in our country, in our state, in our city, in our homes, and in our own lives? What are we sowing? What am I sowing? That's the big reflection point for this idea. The abuse of power. We have to all evaluate where do we have power? Where do we have power? What relationships do you have that give you a position of power? By title or just by default, where do you have a position of power? And do you abuse that power for your gain? 
Do you make a plan to abuse that power for your gain? And then what we need to do is we need to recognize that there's a judgment for that sin. Number two, the sin that Micah calls out is false teaching. False teaching. Micah 2.11. If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. So I was doing some research before COVID, right? That's kind of our big landmark, before COVID and after COVID, right? So before COVID, 27% of pastors said that they had some kind of live stream or video option for their church services. 27%, okay? Around one in four. By April of 2020, now this is, this is old data, by April of 2020, 97 percent of pastors had some live stream or video option available now i'll tell you if they would have asked this church in january of 2020 we would have been in the i'm terrible at numbers 77 percent or whatever that didn't have a video option that was not right was it 73 percent fact checkers 73 thank you okay now here's what i can tell you if they would have asked us this in April 2020, we would have been in that 97%. I'm going to be really careful with what I'm saying, but I want to share what's on my heart when I think about this. Just because the word church is in the name doesn't mean that it's a church that holds up the word of God. Just because content is available doesn't mean that the teaching is true teaching of the word of God. I saw it on TV is not a measurement of validity for the teaching that we encounter. It's not. In fact, this availability of the false teaching today is one of the ways that we know that we are coming closer and closer to the return of Christ. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4 are so familiar but so appropriate for this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We are watching this scripture unfold before our eyes. You're seeing it happen. Do you want to know that the word of God is alive and active? We're seeing this happen. Because there are YouTube channels, podcasts, blogs, video blogs, memes, Instagram reels, Facebook posts, and probably a whole bunch of th ways that I'm not aware of that you can accumulate all the teachers you want. And you can carry all of those teachers that you've accumulated around in your pocket. And you can listen to them anywhere you want to. You can watch their content anywhere that you want to. Anytime you want to. The availability of this teaching creates this anonymity for people to stay inside their sounding tubes to have their ears itched. Because there's no accountability at all. There's no accountability with that. You can accumulate all the teachers you want to tell you whatever you want to be true, that it's true. And it's available. There is not a topic that you can't find teaching that will tell you this is okay. And that's okay. The instruction is the opposite of that. The instruction is the opposite. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So instead of finding teachers that tickle your ears and tell you what you want to hear, what you should in fact have is teaching that reproves you, which is kindly correcting you. You should have teaching that rebukes, which is sharply correcting you. And you should have teaching that exhorts, which is strongly encouraging and urging you to something. That's what you should have. And if you don't have those elements, your teaching 
that you're consuming is probably false. So the judgment for these false teachers is found in Micah 3, 6, and 7. Therefore it shall be night to you, without vision and darkness to you, without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners, diviners put to shame. <clears throat> they, shall cover, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. So the judgment for these false teachers is being completely disconnected from God. If they're not being faithful with the message that God has given them, he shuts it off. Done. Disconnected. When they choose to proclaim things that are not from God, the judgment for that sin is that they are cut off. I'm no longer giving you a word, God says. So here's the litmus test for the hearer. Are you accumulating teachers that itch your ears? Do you get a nice, comfortable, satiated feeling when you hear the word taught? That everything that you are doing is good. That everything you are doing is good. And you should just Stay on the path you're on. That there's no cause for alarm. Do you receive correction? In the teaching you're receiving, are you receiving correction, sometimes gentle correction, sometimes sharp correction? Do you feel encouraged, strongly encouraged or urged to make a change or to go in a different direction than you were going? Do you feel encouraged to persevere? Do you feel encouraged to change? And for the teachers, the test is this, what is your motivation? What is your motivation? Is it for the truth of God's word to help yourself and others grow more and more into the image of God? Or to gain status? Finances? Followers? Views? Likes? Shares? What's the motivation? Those are the questions that we ask when we read a scripture like this about false teaching and the judgment for false teaching. Number three, the sin that he points out, or letter C, I'm, I'm sorry, is wicked leadership. Wicked leadership, Micah 3, 1 through 2a. And I said, hear you, heads of Jacob and the rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice, you who hate the good and love the evil? So leadership, uh, we can get like a big fuzzy strange definition of what leadership is and people can go back and forth on this all the time it's influence it's a place where you have influence that's what leadership is and it's very likely i've said this before that it's very likely if you all were to evaluate your situations and relational dynamics that it's pretty unlikely that there's not somewhere you have influence all of you have influence somewhere. Maybe in the home, maybe with coworkers, maybe with fellow students in class, uh, a group or a civic organization, a ministry at church. Leadership is a position of service, not power. Leadership is a position of service, not power. And when we have it the other way, we've got it upside down. When we think that leaders have power, we're backwards. Leaders serve. Leaders serve and they have influence. So the simple definition of a wicked leader is one that leads people to a place where they love evil and hate good. It's very simple. If your influence is bringing people to a place where they love evil and hate good, you are a wicked leader. You're a wicked leader. And the judgment for that is found in 312. 
Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall be a heap of ruins. The mountain of the house, a wooded height. Destruction. Just a complete destruction and, and left desolate. That's the judgment for wicked leadership. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. I've said this before. Each one of us will give an account of our lives. We'll make an account for everything we've done with what God has provided us and the positions that he has put us in. Micah gave leaders a warning that their wicked leadership would ultimately end in their own ruin and destruction. And we see that it leads to the destruction of those that they were leading as well. So just like the sin of the abuse of power, each one of us should evaluate ourselves. Where do I have influence? Where do I have influence? What relationships, what work setting, what ministry setting am I leading folks in those settings? Am I leading folks towards what is good instead of what is evil? That's the question that we should be asking ourselves. And then also with that, do I see my position of leadership, my influence, Do I see it as a position and an opportunity to serve those folks? Or do I think that I have power over those folks? Now mixed in with these divine judgments are what I'm calling divine restoration. So this is the flip side of that coin. Just like the prophets aren't ministering in a vacuum, and I've said that, they're not ministering in a vacuum, these sins that he's pointing out are happening to people. There are victims of these sins. There are victims of the abuse of power. There are victims of false teaching and wicked leadership. And Micah has a word for those who are victimized, and it's, it's a good word for us today as well. God is aware. God is aware. He's aware of the things that happen to us, and he is pronouncing divine judgments on those things. And he has a plan, a divine plan, to restore as well. So several ways that Micah explains how this divine restoration is laid out and plays out. Letter A under number two is there is an, ex- an, an eternal kingdom. Eternal kingdom. Micah 4, 3 through 4. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their sh- spears into pruning hooks Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. This is a kingdom, an eternal kingdom that has a rule that reaches everywhere. And it's a peaceful kingdom. Imagine that. A kingdom that has reaches to every end of the earth, and it's peaceful. And you remember that scripture is very familiar We looked at that at the beginning of Isaiah 2. There's no need for weapons anymore in this kingdom. We aren't there yet, and we won't get there until Jesus returns. But in order for that to happen, there's going to be, letter B, a final battle. There's going to be a final battle, and Micah eludes to and gives us a glimpse of this final battle. Micah 4, 11, and 12 Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be defiled, and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Micah sees this divine restoration restoration not only in the near term, as the Israelites are brought back from exile, but he sees it in the long term, this eternal kingdom that would come. John gives us a glimpse of this final battle in Revelation. Revelation 19, 17 to 18, the beginning of this. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Out of that, another aspect of this divine restoration is letter C, that there is a coming king. There is a coming king. Micah 5.2 
But you, O Bethlehem, Arapatath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So this phrase from ancient days is interpreted as from eternity. From eternity. Many of your translations will have that from eternity. God reveals his plan through the prophet Micah of this coming king who will rule and reign. The one who God foretold in Genesis 3.15 that would crush the serpent's head. Coming king that leads this army into the final battle. The king that steps out of eternity from a small town of no significance. To be born in a feed trough, to be homeless, to be questioned, to be beat, to be crucified, and then to return. And when he returns, he steps out of eternity once more, but he does it in a much different manner. A much different manner. Backing up in that picture that John gives us, Revelation 19.11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, And in righteousness he judges and makes war. He came first as a baby to die, and he returns as a king who makes war on the nations that have used and abused his people. As a king who divinely restores his kingdom. As a king who lays to waste all who rise against him. And the outcome of that battle We see just a little farther down in the end of chapter 19 in Revelation. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. That's the king. That's Jesus. And he is coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to bring this divine restoration that Micah has foretold. And as so many of the other prophets that we have looked at and will look at have foretold. This is what I want to point out, that this message has unity and continuity. And the unity proves the authenticity in this message. Jesus is coming back. Three times in the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus says it himself, I'm coming soon. He will bring the wrath of God and the judgment of God that these prophets brought warning about thousands of years ago. The warning is still true for us today. Same warning, same God. The warning that preachers have been giving to congregation the warning that calls for a response, the same warning that Jesus himself gave at the beginning of his ministry. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So as we get to this part where we're seeing this divine restoration and this call to repentance, It may leave people asking questions. It left people asking questions in Micah's time as well. What should I do? What would God ask of me? Should I be busy doing good works? Should I get on the hamster wheel and and try to keep the wheel moving and keep things going? What should I give to God to avoid this coming judgment? What do I got to give you, God? What do you need? We read this and it leaves us wondering what does God ask of me? And Micah gives us this divine answer. Number three is a divine answer. The people were asking Micah, okay, got it. I hear you. Bad things are coming. I don't like bad things. What do I do? Um, Do you want sacrifices? Do you want me to sacrifice some calves? 
How about a whole bunch of rams? You want a bunch of rams? Do you want a ridiculous amount of oil? What do you want? Do you want my firstborn? Is that what I need to give you, God? Just tell me what you want and I will give it to you. That's what the people are saying. And Micah 6, 8 tells us this divine answer. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but, but to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? That's the divine answer to those questions that we all ask. That's the divine answer. Any question that we have that's similar to that, that's still the answer. Give me your heart. I want your heart. That's what God says. And I'm going to show you why that means I want your heart. <clears throat> He's saying, give me your heart, make me Lord. Make me Lord of your life. Because if you don't give him your heart and you don't make him Lord, you're not going to act justly to others. You just won't. We're sinners. We're sinners. At our core, without the Lord, we're more concerned about ourselves than others. We are. I am. How many of you have uh, the words to love mercy in your translation that you're reading. To love mercy? That's actually, a, I think, a much better way my, than my ESV renders it. Because if we don't give him our hearts and we don't make him Lord, we don't experience the mercy that God gives us. And so we're not going to love mercy if we don't make him Lord. We basically looked at that same passage back in the book of Amos. The idea that following Christ should make us look at the world and people around us differently than we did before we knew him. We should love the mercy we've received and we should love to share that mercy with others. And again, this is what we, where we went when we were looking at that other passage when we were in the book of Amos. Matthew 22 37 through 40. He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So when we have that divine answer to those questions, what do you want from me, God? When we have the divine answer, just your heart. Just your heart. We can move forward. We can rest in the fact that God is the judge and we're not. We can rest in the fact that if we are in Christ that we will experience the divine restoration that only Jesus, our coming King, will bring. We can move forward and seek to represent Him to the people that He's put in our lives. And we do it in a way that promotes justice and mercy because we've experienced it in our hearts and we've made him Lord. The name Micah means who is like the Lord. That's what his name means. And, and it's a question that Micah really asks with his life. In his 50 or 60 years of ministry as he goes around and tells people, you are going to be judged for what you are doing. And then he says, but you can repent and you can be restored. The question he's saying is, who is like the Lord that would do that? And it also is a rhetorical question. Because there is no one. There is no one. And that's the question that Micah asks with his life and with his ministry. Who is like the Lord? Everything that Micah has said in his whole ministry shows that God is matchless. But the divine answer gives us an insight 
into how we can put on display the one who has no equal. That's how we put him on display. By making him Lord and doing justice and loving mercy. And loving the Lord our God and our neighbor as ourself. So the question is very obvious for this reflection point. Do you have a focus on doing justice? Do you have a focus on doing justice? Do you love mercy? Do you love kindness? And then if you're, if you're doing okay with those, then the last step is to ask yourself, what are some ways practically that you're able to display these traits to the world around you? And if you're evaluating these things and you're saying, that's not me, I don't, I'm not a justice, I don't care about justice and mercy is, I don't do mercy, not big on mercy, uh, I haven't experienced mercy, then today is the day that you need to experience mercy. Today is the day that you need to experience mercy that only comes from the one who there is like no other. Right? A glimpse provided by a prophet in the 700s BC tells us of a time where there will be a divine restoration. And there's a clear line of demarcation here between those who suffer that wrath and judgment and those who are able to enter in to that kingdom where there is peace. And that line of demarcation is what we do with Jesus. That's it. What we do with Jesus. So you have to evaluate for yourself, what have you done with Jesus? Have you surrendered your heart and made him Lord? Or not? So if you haven't, I want to exhort you. Consider the sin that separates you from a holy God and understand that that sin, the penalty, was paid by Jesus Christ on the cross crucified. His blood poured out for your forgiveness and your salvation. And today can be the day where you recognize that sin that has kept you separated and your works that will not earn salvation and you submit to the finished work of Christ on the cross. You accept the gift of salvation, accept the forgiveness of sin, and then you make him Lord of your life. And you watch as he begins to change your heart he begins to change you into one who does justice and loves mercy because you begin to experience that justice and that mercy. Again, I'm having too much fun with these to share them with the other guys. <clears throat> so you'll, both get a, you'll all get a couple weeks off of them, but then we're going to come back and, and we're going to get back into them. I'm going to have the, the worship team come up and we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word today. God, uh, I'm so thankful for the continuity of your message. I'm th so thankful for the continuity and the faithfulness of your messengers who brought these words thousands of years ago. Uh, most of them facing death, great violence, uh, persecution at the delivering of the message. And I thank you, Lord, that we're able to gather under this place today and share that same message. And Lord, it's only because you have given that message and you have always made a way for that message to be released to your people. So God, I pray that today your word as it went out accomplishes the purpose that you have set out for it. In Jesus' name, amen.